look, the workforce needs workers, you need a job, they're the, uh, they're the glue and the, the middleman to make it happen. What you need to do in your search, let's structure the search first. What is a recruiter? And I used to work for a recruiting firm, um, great outfit. Um, I have the utmost respect for these people and what it is that they need to do and what they're trying to do. Look, the workforce needs workers, you need a job, they're the, uh, they're the glue and the, the middleman to make it happen. But what you need to think about as somebody getting recruited and looking to get recruited into a uh, organization is this. Recruiters are salespeople, pure and simple, okay? You are the product, they are selling you to the person buying, which is the company where you wanna be positioned. They have a set of requirements that they are looking for uh, in somebody, ideally it's you, and ideally your skill set and passions and desires around what you wanna do actually matches to the job description that you're looking to get. That's a key thing. Um, how many of us, raise our hands at, at home here, how many of us have ever uh, looked, gotten far enough into, a into the recruitment process or um, actually taken a job then to realize that the job description that we saw and discussed with the recruiter doesn't exactly match what my day-to-day -day, um, or even long-term efforts at that company are going to be. So what you need to understand is first and foremost, the recruiters are, yes, they're going to represent you to the company. But, and I don't want to say that they're not working in your best interests because they are to some extent, but again, they're salespeople. You need to be in control of your destiny. You need to be in control of the narrative for you and your organization, for, for you and yourself and the narrative that you want to have represented to the organization. One, you definitely don't want to be undersold to an org because you might miss an opportunity. Two, you don't want to be oversold to an organization because they might be expecting something you get and start investing time into the process and the timeline, uh, you know, to, you know, it's like a month or two to, right, to, to, to go from, you know, finding the job and then getting to through the interview processes. If you're oversold by the recruiter, it actually does you a major disservice because uh, you're going to get into the pipeline. You're going to have that initial discussion. You're going to then have maybe a technical or a panel uh, interview. You might then have the manager interview. And somewhere in that line, they're going to realize you don't have or meet all the qualifications that they were looking for. And if the recruiter kind of oversold you, again, you're, you're in a bad position. You, you've got to kind of, you've now wasted a, a significant amount of time in that process. Now, ideally something like that happens. Manager, you know, sees uh, opportunity and promise and brings you in but don't count on that. Um, one thing, uh, another area is how to talk about pay, right? So this is the big thing, right? You do wanna get paid for what it is that you're about to go do. You wanna wake up and feel good about what you're working on, but you also wanna know that you're gonna be able to pay your bills, enjoy your life, establish and start building for a future. The rule is the first one to talk about money loses in a negotiation. This is pure and simple. I think I've given this advice to number of people and they they find it quite easy so the conversation goes like this most often recruiter calls you up you're talking to them you love what you hear about the position because you applied for it unless they just outright headhunted for you so you're interested they're interested in you because they met you met all the qualifications that they were looking for and we'll get into kind of the technical aspects of what recruiters can or can't do in a second um here we see that you need to start um having a solid discussion around the um, around the finances, right, for you. Now, a recruiter's got a number that they gotta stay below when it comes to the, um, uh, when it comes to the pricing and the negotiations, right? So they've got kind of a top end, okay? They've got a limit, okay? So say you're trying to, you're going for a, a, a cybersecurity job Entry level, it's paying, you know, the recruiter's got in mind the budget, hey, they can't really go over seventy, seventy-five thousand dollars $75,000. Your entry level, you kind of know what the market is, you know the region that you live in, right? New York City's gonna pay different than um, maybe Cincinnati, right? So you gotta be realistic about that. Uh, so you gotta figure out your cost of living, you gotta figure out your de the demand, right? Are you a data scientist? Can you do like threat hunting, you know, too? Or can you, are you looking for a help desk level job, right? Those are Two different types of skill sets, even in an entry level space. You got to know what you're worth. That's in, that's huge. So here, what we're trying to, what I'm trying to do is, you need to establish what your value is. Okay, 
they know what their top line budget is as far as what it is that they can hit. The question's inevitably going to come out from a recruiter. Brian, hey, calling me up. Brian, we're looking at you for this position. What are you looking to make uh, for this role? Right? Immediately, you might just jump to whatever it is. Don't. Okay? Pause for a second. Calmly ask them or state, look, I know what my value is, recognizing that this is an entry-level position, and this actually works for later in your career as you're doing like regular contract negotiations. You simply need to frame the question around onto the recruiter and say, look, I know what I'm worth. I'm looking for fair market value for uh, this position, this role. I want to be happy in the role long term, and a starting salary is going to be something that establishes that on a go-forward basis. What is the range that the company is looking to pay for this position? Ask your question that way, because the recruiter has that range. That's exactly what they're actually given. They're told, we're looking to pay, hey recruiter, we're looking to go pay between X and X, uh, you know, between 60 and $75,000 for this position, go find me somebody, right? That's what they go off and go do. So if you ask that, and you can get them to then tell you what that range is, you now have the ability to figure out, one, is this even worth my time, or is this well below my value, right? If you're in a position now in your career where you're asking for $100,000, $120,000, and the position comes out, and it's only offering between, you know, fifty five dollars and sixty, dollars well, you thank the recruiter for their time, and you move on to another opportunity. What I think, uh, you know, is good here is that um, you now know what the range is for the role. So you can position it, they're going to give it to you. Now you need to comfortably be able to establish what it is that you're asking for inside of that range that's realistic. Ideally, you know, it's if you're like, oh, well, you told me the top end 70. Pfft, I'm looking for 70. Well, my advice around that is if you're going to take that approach, be able to quickly and easily back up why you demand the top end of that range because that's huge. You know, if you want to take something comfortable and move the needle, go with something middle to top end, but if you're really going to go and state that the top end is exactly what your value is, you better be able to back it up. This brings me to the third point of during the search. Recruiters are not necessarily technical. Uh, I used to have a, a, a role at a recruiting firm, and I loved everybody there, a great group of people. You wouldn't believe how many times I would have technical recruiters looking for developers come down and ask me if you know, this technology or this coding language or this or this or this was something that sh they should be looking for in the role that they were recruiting. Why? It's because they weren't technical, they didn't have the technical background. And that's fine. Again, they're more on the sales side than they are on the technical side. And uh, that's just where their strengths are. And they've found a niche to be able to um, sell, um, you know, sell into this space. I've also seen that recruiting seems to be a stepping stone for for some people to go into eventual sales. What the recruiter really is, isn't looking for is your technical capabilities. They wanna hear, can you speak intelligently? Can they put you in front of a client, right? Can they position you? Can they show their client that they found the right people? They've done the technical evaluations, right? They've run your, your resume through Talent Hook or whatever other online processing to look for all the keywords. They just wanna know, can you tell a story about yourself? Are they going to feel comfortable putting you into an organization that has a culture and people talk and, you know, are you social? Or, you know, do you stare at your shoes and are incapable of coherent sentences and dress, you know, I mean, the first conversation is going to be on the phone, so I'm not going to know how you dress. But, you know, they just want to know, can you speak intelligently? Can you talk about what it is you do? Can you actually sell yourself to the company that they're putting you in? So, anyway, this is the areas on the search. I think these are some, some clutch... Um, spots to kind of like look at when you're looking for um, for a role. Um, so with that, uh, I'll go to some comments we had. How to get an internship in cybersecurity. Uh, Rohit Gupta uh, asked me that here. Uh, apply. Honest to God, like just go apply anywhere you can. Uh, network with your friends, network with your um, colleagues. Uh, you know, just get yourself out there really just network, ask for internships, be ready to do unpaid internships, really whatever it is, just get out there, um, you know, network and, and figure that out, apply through your school, whatever, whatever really you need to. Um, that's, you know, that's my um, advice on how to start getting uh, an internship in security. All right, so let's go on here. Uh, thanks for that question. That's really great. Um, 
your resume. This is going to be your hallmark. This is going to be your business card to the world about you. How do you represent? Again, like I said, um, all these uh, uh, resumes, all your resumes are going through initially. They're just running through a uh, uh, an online platform. It's um, unfortunate, uh, but it's just it's a machine. Like you've got, you know, recruiters are getting hundreds, if not thousands of resumes being submitted to them or they're reviewing. They need to use some level of automation. So they're leveraging some tools that are just looking for keywords out of the job description. And they're using that to initially sort. So make sure that you have the, the skills, the developing languages, the tools, the, you know, whatever the tech is that you have and know, make sure you spell it out. Maybe you include the acronym um, and make sure you include that acronym as well. So if you're looking for it either way, the you know it gets picked up. Make sure your resume is keyword heavy, but appropriate. Don't just go laden your uh, uh, you know resume with a number of keywords and just you know walk away from it. Like it, it needs to be real. You need to be able to defend it. I wouldn't also put keywords or things on there that you maybe touched once. Try to have a grasp of the technology or the concept before you put it onto your. Um, onto your resume. All right, so, oh, another here question. Oh, Rohit just following up with me. Hopefully that was a good answer to your question, Rohit. Um, all right, so other things here. Tell your story, right? Give me a bit of a, you know, an overview, you know? Like, who is Brian, right? Like, what do you want to do? Like, why are you who you are? Just give me a quick, I like that. I think, you know, recruiters are spending, you know, less than 10 seconds on a resume. So after I read your name and your contact information, which is ideally at the top, I'm reading a quick blurb about who you are before I dig into all the backstory, right? Make sure you include your relevant work. I don't care that you worked at a pizza hut. Nobody else does either. Don't put it on there if you're going for a cyber job. Doesn't really tell me a story. Uh, we can talk about it in the interview about how you learned about you know, management and timekeeping and, you know, priorities and all of that, but it has no relevance to the job I'm going to hire you for if I was a CISO and I need somebody else on my team. Just don't put it on there. It's okay if you don't have that depth. I know there's like this push for uh, folks to, um, you know, round out their resumes with all of this uh, time on, um, uh, you know, on their resume to show as if they've been working since like the age of five. As a hiring manager, I don't want to see that. I want to see the stuff that's relevant because that's what I'm hiring you for. Um, definitely put in your education. Um, I've taken the track of not putting down my the year I took. I actually graduated or the years that I went. And I do this because I started college much later in my life. I didn't start. Uh, and I started college when I was 22 and finished it, you know, when I was 26. So if I put my age on, you know, my, my year that I graduated on there, people are going to do math. And think I'm four years, you know, they used to think I was four years younger than I actually was. So, um, if you're in that position, that's my advice. If you're not, don't worry about it. People are going to do math anyway. But include your education. It's relevant. It's important. Try to highlight what you did during your, uh, during your school days, right? Did you work on a specific project? Did you work on a project outside of school that was really important and really impactful and something that you could use on an ongoing basis and, like, leverage in the workplace? Is it show any type of innovation that you are capable of uh, being able to deploy into an organization? Like, I want to be able to see that. I want to see that and hear that as a as a hiring manager. That's something you know I want to hear. Like, are you innovative? Um, one question we used to ask uh, anybody coming onto the security team was, "Tell me about your home network." Right? Um, I guarantee that the stuff you're working on in school may necessarily be completely up to date with the latest and greatest. Tell me about your home network. Do you have one? Do you? That tells me that you're working on things outside of school, you're interested, you're really into the space, you're passionate, etc. right? Including any certifications that you can go get, any other type of accomplishments that you have had throughout your time. Um, you know, make sure these are really clear and concise. What was it? Who was the agency that you, you got it from? What was the impact, right? What was the reason for the certification or the accomplishment? You know, really kind of just kind of highlight that. It doesn't need to be you know, voluminous, it doesn't need to be, you know, flowery, just straight to the point. Just why was this thing as cool as you think it needs to be to be on your resume and have me read it? Take that approach. All right, so what are we going to do here? Um, on site. So you've gotten through the recruiter's phone call. You've probably gotten through an initial phone screening with a manager of sorts. 
Now you're on site. Maybe you even got the job and, you know, use this for the job. What are you doing? How are you making first impressions, right? So first, poor appearance. Uh, first attractor to great work is if you look terrible. I am actually dressed down today because I work remotely. Today I'm not working at a client site and I was motivated to come down here and share with all y'all, um, you know, what's going on and some thoughts and get this, uh, get this message out. But, you know, again, pressed shirt, suit, tie if it's appropriate, ask. Find out before you show up on your first day of work, what's the appropriate garb? And then dress better than that for the first week. Um, I would also learn how men, gentlemen, how many times I've seen this, three button suits, if they're still in style while you're watching this, sometimes, always, never. Okay, those are the three buttons. Sometimes button it, always button the middle one, never button the bottom. Two piece suits, if those are in style when you're watching this or today, always, never. Do not button all three. Don't button and keep all three buttoned and sit down. It looks horrible. Once you get in and you realize that you wore a suit and tie on your first day and everyone else in the office that you're sitting around is not, lose the tie. Take off your jacket when you go to lunch. Roll up your sleeves, it's hot. Be comfortable. Act human. It's okay. You don't need to be perfect now. Just look presentable. It's fine. Um, again, your content doesn't matter if your presentation is weak. So again, personal appearance and written documentation. You could have the greatest ideas in the world, but if your penmanship is terrible, like mine, which is why I type everything, don't write. Um, clearly articulate through your written documentation and through your appearance what it is that you're trying to convey because if it looks poor, chances are I'm not gonna take you as seriously or read it as, as thoughtfully as you want me to as something else. So take the time to make sure that your presentation is spot on. Look the part, right? Again, dress for the job you want, not the one that you have. Um, and know your audience, okay? You can't talk tech necessarily to the CEO, okay? And vice versa, the guys who are sysadmins and running engineering or those, you can talk to them differently. You need to be able to differentiate your audiences and your communication styles and paths and your content, even the acronyms and the tools you're using, they need to be different. When you're talking to middle and higher level management, they want to hear about budget impacts, risk aversion, risk mitigation, um, driving efficiencies into the organization, right? You need to be able to structure your conversations, your presentations, all your documents with that being the message out of your content. Whatever it is that your talk is, that's what uh, really needs to, to be driven. Um, I can't stress that enough. I don't know how many times I've seen things that's like, was this made for somebody who's got an eighth grade reading level and is working, you know, like not in technology? Or did you intend for this to, you know, like, because that's what this reads like. Did you actually intend for this to be read by a senior level manager? Like, what was what was your thought process there? Um, be proactive in your in your thought process and your presentation skills. Like, get out in front of it. Ask. You know, ask people who have worked with the people you're trying to now influence or educate with your uh, with your information. Now that you're, you know, presenting and you're doing work and you're trying to get ideas across, find out how they best receive it. Do some people literally just need to get sat down for five minutes and whiteboarded it and then they get it? Do some people prefer documentation? Do they prefer documentation with a lot of, you know, um, you know, written versus images? Do they just need graphs? Are they a numbers person? Whatever. Find out your audience. Do a little bit of research. Don't just jump in and be like, here's all the info. Congratulations and good luck deciphering it because I don't know your learning style. Um, okay, so anyway, on site, you've got some things to work on, right? No poor appearances. Your content doesn't matter if your presentation's weak. Obviously, look the part and know who your audience is. Uh, last one, right? Some immediate gains. I think if you're still in college today or you're going through your junior, senior year, whatever it is, um, Here's some classes that I think are, and some, some kind of just some thoughts that I've given uh, students, I personally took myself, that are going to benefit you no matter what role you go into. One, definitely for cybersecurity and if any type of IT role, take a technical writing class. Like, just, I realize nobody likes to do the documentation, right? That's probably the number one reason it doesn't get done. But as practitioners and as you get more into senior level management especially when your systems start being audited or reviewed as they will be 
you don't have the documentation, guess what? It's not like you get out of it. You still have to go do it. You just need to go do it quickly and now, and now it becomes a priority. If you have the opportunity to properly document what it is you're working on through and through, and that it could be code comments, that could be just, you know, system security plans if you're within DOD. It could just be, you know, current state architecture reviews and data flow diagrams. I don't care what it is. Do it while you can, while you're working on it. One, it's gonna be fresh in your mind. Two, it's gonna be a lot more accurate. And three, you're already on the project. You might as well take the time to be able to invest to build that documentation out now. You can learn how to build out a lot better documentation through a technical writing class. Uh, I know Morrisville, when I was there, great class. Um, uh, Professor Muse, thank you so much for, um, for, uh, for that. And um, really everybody else there that uh, you know, kind of pushed that as one of the requirements. But again, technical writing, huge thing. Two, project management. Learn how projects get managed, how programs get managed. Understand what a milestone is. Understand how to move deliverables, how to ask for deliverables, how to, uh, you know, just, just overall project management. If you don't want to be a project manager, fine, but at least understand how to operate within the project management life cycle and kind of space, because guess what? Even if you're not going to be a project manager, you will inevitably work on a project. So you better learn kind of the rules at which the project manager is going to hold you to. And the easier you make that on yourself, the easier you make it on them, which then in turn makes it more easy on yourself. So again, project management. The next two are kind of an interesting twist, but I think sociology and psychology classes are really important. And this goes into actually the last point of customer service. Everybody is in a customer service job. I'll say it again. Everyone is in a customer service job. Whether you like it or not, like Bob Dylan said, and I'm not actually old enough to know this, but I listen to a lot of music. Everybody's got to serve somebody. Plain and simple. Even the CEO has to um, listen to and, you know, work with uh, the shareholders or the board. So, understanding psychology and sociology, for me, having that view gives you a glimpse into how do people think, right? And if you can, and you can kind of get into how do people think, how do people react, how do people operate, um, you get that understanding, you can understand a lot better about why people do certain things cultural differences, societal differences, political, whatever it is, you can understand it. Um, you know, influencing enemies, winning friends kind of a thing, right? That, that whole approach. But the last part really is take a customer service job. If you've never had um, a customer service role like waiting tables or bartending or even just working at a cash register at, you know, a gas station or, a, you know, supermarket or whatever, if you've never had that you know, be in a customer service position, then you're really missing out on the ability to learn about human behaviors, not only others, but your own. Do you know how you're going to respond if somebody gets in your face about something that they're angry about or upset about? Well, that can happen at work. And I think unless you know how you're going to react, you're gonna be in a bad spot to be able to address those types of behaviors for yourself. Take these early years. Again, we started this whole conversation for, um, for college students. Take these early years while the risk is low and chances are you need the money anyway. Go get a customer service position. Do it for the summer. Do it you know, after hours while you're at school. Really just take the role. Learn how others operate. Learn how other people buy. Learn their habits. Learn kind of like what sways people one way or another. I think it's a, it's a really good learning experience, but you're also gonna be able to learn about yourself. You're gonna be able to learn what sets you off, what makes you impactful. What are conversations that you can easily have that you can you know, later remember how you did them when you're in a, um, you know, when you're, when you're in the, uh, a more professional workplace or an office setting. Anyway, um, just some immediate gains. I think these are things that you can do right now uh, while you're in school and you can take advantage of. Um, and you know, you'll see some benefit, you know, later on, um, you know, in, uh, in your career. Anyway, these are some thoughts. Uh, I hope everybody enjoyed this. Uh, you're taking the time out during your lunch hour. It's now one o'clock on the East coast. This is Brian Hoagley with side channel. Follow us around on social media land. Oop, can't see my hand on uh, social media land on uh, sizzle life. And, uh, you know, if you're not in a position uh, to be able to do it, uh, yet, 
please start making plans to enable MFA, probably the number one thing that any organization or individual can do. Uh, check out our previous um, uh, videos. Check us out on YouTube, like I said, on LinkedIn here. Uh, you can follow us on Twitter and Instagram as well. Uh, now we're actually publishing out to TikTok. So if you've got an even shorter attention span, you can find us there. Again, hey, Brian Hoagley's uh, side channel.